All right, here we go with the last chapter of Lincoln, How Abraham Lincoln Ended Slavery in America by Harold Holzer. All right, very interesting chapter. Death of a Liberator. As it turned out, neither the constitutional amendment nor the Hampton Roads peace talks ended the Civil War as quickly as Abraham Lincoln desired. Hoping for a breakthrough, the president had decided to travel to Virginia to confer with the Confederate negotiators himself. Say to the gentlemen, I will meet, meet with them personally at Fortress Monroe as soon as I can get there, Lincoln telegraphed General Grant before leaving Washington on February 2nd. Grant was one of the few leaders told about the meeting. Otherwise, the trip remained top secret. On the morning of February 3rd, Lincoln and Secretary of State Seward began four hours of discussions with the three rebel commissioners on board the presidential steamship River Queen. No one kept a record of the discussion. One thing we do know for sure, the Confederate commissioners came to the conference prepared to offer peace in return for slavery. But Lincoln insisted on what he called indispensable conditions. The Confederate states must recognize federal authority. There would be no pause in hostilities short of an end of the war and the disbanding of all forces hostile to the government. And perhaps most of all, he would tolerate no receding on the slavery question. Receding means kind of backing up. So he was not going to back up. The message was clear. Abraham Lincoln would not trade black freedom for peace. Once Seward also informed the peace commissioners that the House of Representatives had just passed the resolution sending the 13th Amendment to the states for ratification, the negotiations all but collapsed. The secret peace conference ended in failure, but in a way, slavery itself ended that day too. Faced with one of the biggest decisions of his life, Lincoln would not compromise on freedom. When Lincoln returned to the White House, he took up an equally important task, the writing of his second inaugural address, scheduled for the following month conditions looked better. The peace conference may have failed, but Union forces under Grant were succeeding under Lee's starving Confederates in Virginia. The rebellion looked doomed, and the end might finally be near. Under the circumstances, Lincoln might easily have used his March 4th inaugural address to take credit for the approaching victory, but he did not. Instead, in one of the most remarkable speeches of his entire life, Lincoln did the unexpected. He asked Northerners to share blame for the war. Instead of stressing the fact that the Northerners had long opposed slavery, he pointed to the fact that they too had long accepted it. There was more than enough guilt to go around, and if God meant the war to continue until all the guilty were punished for their sins, North as well as South, then Lincoln warned that the bloodletting would continue. For the first time, the audience was gathered, the audience that gathered outside the Capitol for a presidential inaugural was fully integrated. Black and white people alike listened to the striking words that seemed to accept the tragic reality of war while looking to a future of peace. This is how he concluded what was perhaps his greatest oration. Again, oration is a speech and an orator is someone who gives speeches. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lap shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and for his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish, cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. As usual, Republicans and Democrats differed radically in their responses to Lincoln's speech. The pro-Lincoln Washington Intelligencer, that's a newspaper, declared that its concluding paragraph deserved to be printed in gold. But the anti-Lincoln Chicago Times called the oration slipshod. Lincoln himself worried that it was not immediately popular. As he admitted, men are not flattered. 
by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. Nonetheless, Lincoln still expected the speech to wear as well as, perhaps better than, anything I have produced. One observer who brought a distinct point of view to Lincoln's performance was Frederick Douglass, who attended the ceremonies as a guest. When it was over, Douglass headed to the White House for a post-inaugural reception, but guards there refused at first to permit an African-American to join the all-white event. Not to be deferred, deterred, Douglas, pu Douglas pushed his way inside and made his way toward the president's side. Glimpsing him as he approached, Lincoln's face lighted up and he startled his conservative guests by loudly announcing, here comes my friend Douglas. The abolitionist leader never forgot what happened next. As I approached him, he reached out his hand, gave me a cordial shake and said, Douglas, I saw you in the crowd today listening to my inaugural address. This is no man's opinion that I value more. There is no man's opinion that I value more than yours. What did you think of it? I said, Mr. Lincoln, I cannot stop here to talk with you as there are thousands waiting to shake you by the hand. But he said again, what did you think of it? And I said, Mr. Lincoln, it was a sacred effort. And then I walked off. I'm glad you liked it, he said. That was the last time I saw him. Um, here's a picture I wanna show you. Um, let me read the caption first. Lincoln delivers his second inaugural address from the U.S. Capitol, March 4th, 1865, as seen in a photograph by Alexander Gardner. So an inaugural address um, is the speech that the winner of an election gives. So here he is, all those people watching. <laughs> a few days later, feeling more relaxed at last, Lincoln decided that he wanted to be on hand in Virginia for what he hoped would be the end of the war. On March 23rd, the President, Mary, and Ted took a boat to visit Grant's army in Virginia. Robert had briefly visited Washington for the inauguration, but had since returned to the army, and his parents planned to see him when they reached headquarters. Though Lincoln stayed with Grant for more than two weeks, Mary had an embarrassing public outburst midway through their stay and returned to Washington. While she was back at the White House, Lincoln reported that he had enjoyed a four-hour reunion with Bob, who seemed well and in good spirits. Missing her husband and children, Mary asked if she could return to Virginia. Tad and I are both well, the president replied, and will be glad to see you. Unfortunately for her, Mary was not yet back on the scene when news reached Lincoln and Grant that the Confederate government had fled from, from Richmond. Union forces had marched in without opposition and now occupied the one-time enemy, enemy capital. Overjoyed, Lincoln resolved to visit the city. I want to see Richmond, he told Admiral David Dixon Porter even though Porter, Grant, and others worried for his safety there. On April 12th, I'm sorry, on April 4th, Tad's 12th birthday, Lincoln set out by ship for the Concord City with 12 sailors and Marines as his only guards. Because torpedoes or mines still filled the surrounding waters, the presidential party was forced to transfer twice to successively smaller boats. By the time the group reached land, the leader of what had become militarily the mightiest nation in the world was riding in a modest rowboat. Lincoln and Tad stepped ashore and began walking up the hill, the acrid smell of smoke filling their nostrils as they strolled, for the Confederates had set fire to much of the town before escaping. Richmond was in ruins, still smoldering. All right, I'm going to stop there for today.